three, two, one, go. Everybody to the Tried of the Fours podcast, a podcast from three Puerto Rican friends coming together to do deep dives into Star Wars and other nerd-related media. Today we have another very, very special very, episode. Oh my God. What's happening? Yeah. How it's, are we getting invited to these things? How how are yeah? This is why 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 is this happening? Are we are we are we good all of a sudden? Uh, are we are we are we deserving? Yes, yes, we are. We put in the work. Christmas presents deserving. early. <laughs> Christmas, yeah, it's like Christmas, birthday, like everything packed together. To everything like one, combined. One jumbo, one jumbo <laughs> present. But what are you talking about, Nanny? What what surprise uh, thing are we we're a part of? What what, what is this? Well, this, this little podcast, the Triad of the Force, was yeah, invited to another small amazing but powerful. round table. Yeah. <laughs> a round table where we were discussing once again the show that we've been, like I've said before, a smidge, you know, obsessed a, with. A smidge. <laughs> smidge. Andor this time. What a good show. Ooh, talking to Bo oh. Williman, the writer of oh. episodes eight, nine, and ten, which have been no words, Amazing. just incredibly Amazing. fantastic. I have yet to see episode 10, but tomorrow when the well, at the, at the at the time that this is released, you'll have seen it. It will be life out. Will be different. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. <laughs> and we also have Sana Wollenberg, the executive producer. Yep, yep, yep. So again, a round table. So we got a lot of podcaster friends who joined this time. Booze, why don't you let her? Uh, no. So some of these friends we've uh, been, like most of them actually, we've talked to in the past. Some of them are very good friends we've had on the channel before. Others we've met at the at the launch event. Others we met like at Star Wars Celebration. So it was a, it was a nice little home. It's like always nice to when you pop in the the meeting and then all of a sudden like you know all the tile tile blocks start populating yep. you see all these like, familiar I know faces you. like hey, I know you. <laughs> we're, we're we're friends i guess i know uh, <laughs> but among them or among them one of our very good friends chase that gay jedi uh, also the tatooine sons were there this is the first time we actually participated in something with them uh, alex damon from star wars explain good friend from the channel brian barry from pink milk the friends of the force blast points and our very good friend Alden Diaz from Octo Radio with his with our friend Nikki was were also there. So it was a very good mix of people there and a really awesome opportunity because I remember uh, this might be controversial, but you know, uh, sue me. House of Cards was one of my favorite shows uh, back in the day during like the Netflix, you know, when Netflix was becoming. Oh, that wasn't the writer's a, fault. That was Kevin Spacey's fault. I, I know <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Spacey. Well, Kevin Spacey. <laughs> Fuck Kevin Spacey. Uh, he's a he's a right. horrible, horrible person. We know that, and there's no need to you know uh, go back. The writing and, was still and discuss, good. And discuss what horrible things Kevin Spacey has done. But before all of that had come out, and we you know decided as a community and and society <laughs> that like we're no longer at you know putting this person in projects anymore. Uh, House of Cards was really one of those great shows that really connected with me, and like there was always a name that showed up at the beginning of the credits and it was Bo Williman and he was the showrunner and writer for for that series and like to finally be able to talk with him even if it was just one question was such a privilege and obviously now he's part of the Star Wars galaxy so it's just like oh my god a writer from one of my favorite shows that I can never watch again and now writing for this amazing show in the Star Wars galaxy that we're so enjoying so 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 much has been a, a pleasure mm. and santa wallenberg man what a what a badass woman too i mean she was the executive producer on on chernobyl which is another series that i absolutely adored and she had some amazing insight as well into into andor so like this this you know it was really 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 cool and that's smorgasburg of greatness a smorgasbord of greatness it was a potpourri a potpourri as well <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as we've mentioned before, like it's one of the other round tables, it's really cool to not just be able to talk, you know, to those creators because they have really cool insight. And we're the special edition DVD, so to speak, uh, talking to them and being the bonus content. Uh, <laughs> I like that. But also seeing, but also seeing like the points of view, right? That all our our other podcasting slash YouTuber friends have in terms of like approaching uh, those questions. So. It's fun. It's fun. It's very, very gratifying and humbling to be part of 
these and enlightening uh, and, and enlightening this makes you happy you know and i and i really and i really hope that like the happiness that we've had like talking to these creators is projected onto like everyone that's gonna listen now to, like this interview because i think it was really enlightening really fun i think everyone had a really good time not just like asking the questions but i think like bo and sana like also were really engaged with uh with the with the with their answers because you know they were very eloquent and really really thoughtful in the answers that they gave us so i don't know i think i'm rambling no one wants to listen to me talk they want to listen to bo and sana uh yeah, some interviews. potential potential mm-hmm. spoilers maybe potential uh comments on what might come from and or season two no i'm kidding they they, they don't they don't <laughs> say spoilers but at least you know but at least talk about you know how the show came to be and like the process which i think is really cool but i'll shut up manny why don't you introduce uh, the the, the, the interviews? without <laughs> further ado here are the interviews enjoy Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Gustavo from Trial of the Force. Very excited to talk to you guys. Uh, so my question is for both of you. Uh, Andor so far has been a very precise and deliberate show. Uh, the pacing has been very intentional until we get like these moments that just hit you like a sledgehammer. Especially episode 10, we get a line from Luthen towards the end of the episode where he says, I've made my mind a sunless place. I share my dreams with ghosts. Like moments like that just like really capture what the feeling and and theming of the episode is and the series as a whole so my question is like how do these moments come about like how do we decide what characters kind of have like these moments that just like just punch you in the face and just like make your jaw drop i don't know it's it's uh, it's it's like sort of like asking uh you know uh professional ice skater like you know how, how do you do how do you how do you do like a triple lots i <laughs> a lot of practice and a lot of falling down <laughs> until you get it right <laughs> um I, I i mean first and foremost it all starts with tony gilroy uh, he walked into the writer's room with uh, about an 80 page bible a very extensive and detailed idea of what he wanted to do over the course of the season there were some big gaps along the way which he admitted that we needed to figure out and um and 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 some things that he brought in that we ultimately tossed and and came up with better i hope better ideas for uh but he started with a very clear vision and and characters like luth and rail for instance or cyril and deirdre um and and some of the others along the way uh pretty fully formed you know and and so dan what danny and i were trying to do was uh just help flesh that out deep and ask questions poke holes um see if we could replace really good ideas with even better ones um you know uh but 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 tony's vision and leadership really gave us a, a running start uh you know, when you talk about something like Kino Lloyd's uh, uh, arc over the course of these three seasons, we, the the notion of a prison was a pretty vague one. We knew that, okay, here's a guy who's just on the Aldani raid. Now he's on the run. Naturally, it's most interesting if something stops him being on the run. What's the most extreme version of that being thrown into a prison? Uh, how do we do a prison that isn't like every other prison movie you've ever seen in your life? Uh, it started almost from a very rudimentary place of where, of well, most prisons are sort of dark and damp and lots of shadows and dirty. What if this one's like super bright and clean? You know, if most prisons have lots of guards, what does a prison look like that has a very few guards? How do you pull that off? Um, maybe they're maybe it's a factory. Maybe they're building something. Who knows? And 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 Kino is a character that we developed in the room from scratch. Uh, and and you know layer by layer first it's like well maybe he's a foreman maybe he buys into the system maybe maybe Cassian has to convince this guy in order to have a chance of getting out and maybe now he becomes this opportunity for a mini arc where you see how over a very short amount of time someone can go from plugging into the system as a sort of automaton into becoming a rebel which is part and parcel of the larger story that we're trying to tell of Cassian and and so you you kind of just almost approach in these very rudimentary simple ways layer up you know one one uh you know you're learning sort of i don't i don't know why i brought up ice skater analogy because i know nothing about ice skating um but but you know you you got to do one twirl before you do two and then three and and eventually you 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 hit something and you land it and you feel like that feels right you know so 
Um, hello. Um, I wanted to bring up something, Bo, that you mentioned at your BAFTA screenwriters lecture, because I've studied and worked in theater my whole life. And in that talk, you mentioned how discoveries made in earlier episodes can have an influence and ripple effect on scripts that are still in development, much like a theatrical production process. So for either of you, have there been any standout moments like these while you while you both were working on Andor, like any moments that you revisited or rediscovered while writing that were influenced from earlier scenes or earlier episodes that you may have worked on? I think Sonnen's better for this one because she's been in the trenches with Tony since before I arrived and, and long after I, <laughs> I finished my last draft on the script. Uh, so you've, you've witnessed everything, Sonnen. I think, I think, you know, certainly for all the, you know, really strong vision and kind of over, you know, kind of overriding kind of story arc, you know, that Tony brought into the room and that we that were then fleshed out with the help of his, you know, trusted collaborators, you know, um, Bo and, and Dan, you know, as and then you know whatever whatever wherever we took it at the writers' room, of course, then the really hard work starts because then everybody took these episodes away and then the, you know made them into you know you know an outline and then of course right really digging deep to writing the script and I think you know things evolve and you really dig deep for you know it, the finding the broader you know of a pass is you know and getting that right is you know was kind of quite you know, dynamically and quickly achieved when you have, you know, three very strong, you know, creative, you know, people in a room, you know, that really know and trust each other. And, you know, the speed that was actually in the, in the, the creative feeding of each other was kind of really fast. But then when everybody dug in deeper, of course, you come across other questions and, and new things and they constantly feed back and forward and, and, and you know, and good ideas, then you're, you know, then you feed them back, you know, backwards. And I think that is a, that evolving thing when you strive for perfection and finding a very intricate, you know, multi-layered, you know, piece with a huge, you know, with a lot of players within the way. I think that is very much part of the process. And and if you pay attention to that and really benefit from what you find and keep on challenging, you know, the own process, you come, you know, hopefully, you know, you get to something very, you know, complex and multi-layered and rewarding at the end. And I, I think I got lucky too, because, uh, the, Nate, the prison is such a big build, and Sana actually had to make that happen with Luke. Uh, that I believe the prison block was shot last, right, Sana? It was, it was shot last because we were quite contained and it seemed the right way, um, you know, to kind of finish the whole show. But it also really allowed, you know, for Bo writing, when you're dealing with something, with anything that you could write, and when you dug deeper into it, when you were left with actually having to produce the scripts, we had to create and Luke was our designer and you had to, you know, if it's a constant feeding back, okay, if I get to go to that corner and how does I do this? And how would this work in the prison? And it's a constantly evolving thing and having that time for that very specific world to, to kind of evolve and, you know, to be written and for us to be then allowed to, you know, able to create it. It was a good place at the, you know, to shoot it last. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and so I, you know, I'm lucky that it benefited from, uh, this incredible cast that now had months working together, Sana and Luke and everyone else. Uh, they, you know, here, here was, I, I basically got to benefit from this is the the final push here. And in a way, I guess all of those prisoners escaping Narkina 5, at the end, it was also for all of you, like, we're finally wrapping production. <laughs> One way out. <laughs> <laughs> One way out. <laughs> you printed t-shirts for everybody with it on. I, uh, I'm Sam with Tatooine Sons. First, episode 10 uh, is an absolute masterpiece. I think we can all agree with that. Um, and Andy Serkis's performance could easily win him an Emmy, in our opinion. Um, but I've just got a quick two-part question. First, did you have Andy Serkis in mind when uh, you wrote that speech to the prisoners? And second, when he was leading them in chanting One Way Out, as y'all were just saying, um, were you already considering the harsh reality that Kino Loy can't swim and potentially doesn't make it out of the prison himself? Great questions. And uh, I dig you guys a setup there. Like you've, you've really yeah. got the lighting in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, um, great questions. Uh, when we're de developing characters, especially ones that were developed in the room from scratch, the way Kino was, uh, sometimes you might bang around like, you know, what a, 
what is this person like? Who might play them? And sometimes you're talking about an actor that you know might be you know from 50 years ago or something. You're you're trying to get a sense of a vibe. You're not necessarily trying to cast it in the room. Uh, wasn't thinking of Andy or any actor when uh, per se specifically like we're writing this towards this actor. Um, uh, but we were definitely going for a, a, a particular vibe. Um, and and when uh, the, and what we did know was that we wanted to write one hell of a, a cameo arc. That this was for 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 something that a, a really great guest actor could come in and essentially kind of headline those three episodes as the face of this prison. We wanted to write a role that could attract someone amazing, and um, and so luckily for us. Uh, you know, Andy was was available and wanted to do it and felt like winning the lottery um, because we were like, if we don't get someone of, of that caliber, the, the I don't think, you know, the prison will work, you know, but also I so, think eventually, you know, when when the three scripts, you know, were kind of, you know, all there and had just, you know, evolved it, he really became somebody that I think we all felt, you know, really drawn to, and it kind of became a natural, you know, a natural bit of casting for us. And then, you know, we were, you know, we were lucky that, you know, he felt the same about, you know, our, you know, our show and that part, and, you know, and the rest is for everybody to enjoy. In, in terms of the very end, I can't swim. No, I mean these are these things where you don't start with that necessarily. Uh, first is like okay, what's the journey this guy has? You know, he he's plugged into the system. He's, if he's not pro empire, he's kind of a shill for it, for out of pure <laughs> self-interest. Um, and we, okay, we're going to have a prison break at the end and he's going to be leading the way. That's quite an arc over the course of three episodes. Mm -hmm. But you're always looking, how do you subvert expectations? How Or how do you, uh, in a good way, and replace right. them with something better? How do you have the most emotional impact? If there's a triumph for this guy, you know, is there also a tragedy? Uh, and I forget whether we were talking about Luthen's speech uh, first with Young or or the ending for Kino, but we were very interested in the theme of sacrifice. Hmm. Uh, and and so, I mean, it's so rousing. I, I I mean, I knew what would happen when I watched that episode again recently, episode ten, and I was still like my pace, right. my pulse was mm -hmm. racing and. Uh, and and to think they finally have made it out to this place a, where we begin with three episodes, two episodes before, this might be the last breath of fresh air that you ever breathe in. Mm -hmm. And here they are breathing that fresh air and there's there's freedom in front of them. Mm -hmm. It, I don't, it, I don't, I remember it was in the room and I don't remember who said it first. Maybe it was me, maybe it was Tony, but you're, you're putting yourself in the physical space of now I finally get to dive into the water and try to swim for my freedom. And I think we were trying to do just the math of like, okay, uh, how far away from the shore? Is it a mile? Is it two miles? Can these guys actually, you know, how many of them are going to make it? Are there going to be TIE fighters coming in? Like, you know, how, what does it take you an hour to swim? Is that realistic? Like we're, we're dealing with just like the basic logic issues and then it was like what if kino can't swim <laughs> wow what if and then you're like oh of oh my god he's just led five thousand people to freedom wow. and when and then you think of the line i'm gonna consider that i'm uh, that i'm already dead yeah because he knows mm -hmm. even if he makes it out there hmm. that, that he's a goner hmm. and then you're just like well uh that's that's when the story almost takes over and tells you what it needs to do. You're like, it's obvious that that must be done. Hmm. You know, it's not even a, up for debate. Hmm. Thank so you. These, really these, things, these things sort of arise slowly and surely and organically. I wish we were brilliant enough to know that <laughs> from the get go, but you kind of <laughs> have to, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Alex from Star Wars Explained. Um, the prison arc, especially episode 10, is one of my new favorite Star Wars stories, and you just broke my heart again talking about it. Uh, it it's so well done. But the first two episodes, oh, the first two episodes are very bleak for a Star Wars story. The balance between despair and hope that has to be tricky to achieve. So how did you achieve that balance? And were there any moments or situations that you considered for Narkina 5 that you ultimately decided, like, no, that's too far for a Star Wars story? 
Mm. Well, Asana can speak more in terms of, you know, if, if, if anything down the, the road ended up being too far, although I, uh, from what I remember us discussing the room and, and working on in the scripts, we pretty much did what we set out to do. Yes, yeah, but I, I, I mean, in terms of, look, in the previous three episodes, you have the Aldani raid, uh, or I mean, there's one episode that sort of buffers between those, those, but but if Cassian's been on the Aldani raid, this was a one and done. This is, you know, I want some money in my pocket. I got to get out of here. Maybe I'm a little swayed by the, you know, the manifesto. Maybe I'm sort of seeing the, you know, the, the way that the Aldanis are being treated and is starting to, you know, I, I know, I know, you know, what, what happened on Ferrix and, and maybe this is starting to, make me feel a little more anti-empire you know i mean we know he's anti-empire but i mean in a more sort of in a way with more agency um but then he goes off to niamos and he he's doing what he set out to do which is take the money and run and disappear uh so if you really want to see the process of someone becoming a full-fledged rebel they he needed to be confronted with the full oppressive weight of the empire uh and and it, it seemed like the very best place to do that is in a prison that kills hope you know um if if you're trying eventually to get to a new hope you have to ask yourself the question uh um why is that hope new because that hope was being smothered so let's see it but then we know we're going to give the audience some friggin' hope by the end of it, at least. So it's worth the journey, and I hope we earn that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Caitlin from Sky Talker. It's so nice to speak with you both today. Um, we've talked some about Cassian and the prison, and I wanted to shift gears and ask about Mon Mothma's story in these episodes. Um, we spent the majority of our time with her within her home and with her family. Can you talk about some of the writing choices that led to telling her story largely from within the home thus far? Well, with Mon Mothma, I mean, first of all, we we have we knew we had the amazing actor Genevieve O'Reilly to to bring life to this character, and she's so capable. And so uh, uh, we knew we could we could we could uh, we could do almost anything we want there, and she could pull it off. And if you're you're asking yourself questions about people's journeys over the course of this series, um, she's becoming radicalized too. Uh, and 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 with her cousin Vel representing the face of someone who's actually willing to get in the trenches, uh, showing back up to her her home and reminding her that rev that revolution uh, actually requires uh, violence and and sacrifice and danger. Seeing her begin to process that and think about sacrifice in a very real way, as opposed to an abstract way, is, uh, is, is crucial to her story. Uh, and, and how, and, 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 and it's sort of, you know, making you think about, okay, you need people that are willing to die for a revolution or a rebellion. You also need people that are willing to raise the money <laughs> to buy those people the weapons and things they need in order to pull it off. And so it's, it's trying to paint the, pic the fullness of the picture of, as, as sort of, you know, disparate and kind of frayed and non-organized as the rebellion is at this stage, uh, how does it begin to coalesce? Um, and But then what does it feel like to be in a senator's shoes who has the burden of that on her shoulders? And, and you know, in ep if episode 10 really does focus on sacrifice and you're hearing Luthen talk about how he sacrificed everything, you're seeing people like Kino and many other prisoners are sacrificing their lives for the greater good so that some of them can escape, if not all of them. You're, you're looking at a potential sacrifice, or at least a sacrifice that's asked of Mon, of, of her daughter. And we don't know what she's going to do yet. Stay tuned. But we, I hope, have done you know, the storytelling up until this point to get the sense that being married at 15th to uh, 15 years old to Perrin maybe wasn't her favorite thing in the world. And now she's being asked to consider sacrificing her daughter to the same tradition for the greater good. You know, but so. 
But also, ahead, you know, Mosma, Mon Mosma has been a character that, you know, we have overseen the public persona and, you know, and we have seen, a, you know, a very particular Mon Mosma and, and really what Under does, you know, really goes right behind the scenes and takes a character in a different, and shows us a very different aspect of her life. I, I mean, I would hope that people were gasping when you realize that she is actually fundraising money for the rebellion. And, you know, and, and, you know, and I think anything, you know, the humanity of her story and what brings her to become a rebel herself is, you know, automatically brings you also back to your families. You know, it is about, you know, her family connection and her, her birth, you know, made her a senator at the tender age of 16 and dictated a lot of her life and she has given it to it willingly. It's like, you know, she she took that burden on, you know, like a queen, you know, kind of descending a, a throne and, and, you know, it had a huge personal impact on her life and the empire crouching down now compromising also what she tried to believe to do through the Senate, you know, is you know, is a human story to tell and, and the family connection, the impact of her marriage, her life as a mother, her old friendships, all those things are actually you know, very much humanity and show you how hard it is to make decisions when somebody pushes you too far that you can no longer, you know, be silent and do nothing. But the human sacrifice is huge. And I think therefore bringing us into her home feels very important um, and, 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 and significant, you know, to tell what her sacrifice is and who she is and, and why she acts, you know, in the way she does when we know the perfect persona that she has to play most of her life. Hello, thank you for your time today. I'm Brian from Pink Milk, where we talk Star Wars queerly. And um, first, I want to say thank you for creating Cinta and Bell for us. Uh, we know in the past that Disney's been reluctant to acknowledge queerness exists. Um, I also want to say thank you to Bo for writing that beautiful dinner scene where her queerness is actively challenged. Many of us queer folks have had to or continue to sit at those um, <laughs> dinner conversations, especially with Thanksgiving looming here in the United States. <laughs> um, I'm curious if there was any difficulties in creating those two characters and if so what sacrifices were had to make to get them on screen well uh, luckily uh i'm really uh, the, I, I i mean as far as i'm aware there, there was no pushback whatsoever as far as i'm aware and and uh you know i i i think you know, first of all, let me say all credit goes to Tony, sort of in the vision and conception of this show, and and um, and I think that you know when we were talking about Vel and Cinta early on, we weren't necessarily even talking about them being in a relationship. That was a discovery. You know, it wasn't like oh, we want to uh, let's let's have this queer couple here at the center of our show. No, um, we we were we had we had. Vel, which we knew from the Bible, was going to be a very important character. She's related to Mon, and and um, and we really liked the tension between being the sort of rich girl from Chandrilla on the one hand, and then eating the grubs, you know, and and sleeping in a tent out on Aldani. <clears throat> but as we had to populate Aldani, we wanted these to be interesting people, you know, we're not just sort of like. Uh, uh, you know, meat for the meat grinder that are going to get, you know, sort of torn up by this raid. Let's really consider each of them. And Cinta started to emerge. Yes. Then kind of organically. Yeah, um, they, they had to go out with each other. It just, it just became yeah, like, part of the story. We really didn't set out, but it just felt really right for, for, for both of the characters and for the Aldani gang and for our show generally, for for Vel's choices in life. And, you know, part of why she turned her back on her Chandrillion rich girlness, you know, she clearly had, to, you know, had to, you know, fight, you know, for, for being, you know, it's all the problems that you know that we know that you know that it will be in the galaxy as true as as they are here on earth i think and it's just it just feels right to 
you know, to broaden. Yeah. If we are going, you know, if we are the kitchen sink side and we're going really, you know, you know, into all these characters and get to know them, you inevitably want to know who they're like and how they live and what makes them taken, you know, not only for this one big moment, but generally. And I think the well that we meet, you know, who she is and who she loves and and you know and and is really a part of who she became and how she also became the rebel of the course. So it was just a very natural thing. And we never got any pushback from anybody. And thank God it is 2022 and just about time that we can depict, you know, all of society um, rather than only very particular, acceptable, um, you know, traditional ways. I think though, I think the key, you know, and in, 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 and I hope why it works, you know, is that, uh, we started with people out in the world trying to foment rebellion, um, and that's it. And then who are these people? And that we didn't start with this character is gay or this character is straight or this character is bi or this you know character is anything other than let's start with them. Let's drop in with them in action, trying to do something. Um, and then, and then, if we arrived at that, it happened organically. So it, it it's not what defines the characters. It's just part of who the characters are, you know. And I, um, and and I, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's how it happened. And uh, and then, and then, once you've made that choice, you just now have to be in the reality of these two characters to say, okay, what is this relationship? What what's right about it? What's wrong about it? What's work? What works? What doesn't? And then, what are the dramatic implications down the line? You know, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brad from uh, Friends of the Force. Uh, speaking of Cinta and Bell, um, something Cinta says is, "I'm a mirror. You love me because I show you what you need to see," which I thought was an amazing line. Um, likewise, I think fans are loving Andor because it's showing us what we, the viewers, need to see about this point in history and I think dystopian stories are at their best when they say something about our own world so uh, for you guys for both of you what sort of big ideas were important for you to examine through the show whether it be this whole season or this this sort of three episode arc and what do you hope viewers see and or truth as well uh San has been much more front row seat from the very beginning all the way through so I want to turn it over to her but but I'll, I will say that Tony walked into the room saying, I want to think about this first season as the education of Cassian Andor, right? Like how, what does it take to go from being a, a sort of self-serving um, <clears throat> guy who, who, who uh, you know, may have a distaste for the empire, but is ambivalent in terms of doing anything about it to what does he need to go through an experience in order to have a real transformation where he is choosing by choice to, 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 to walk towards re rebellion. Um, and, and so I think, how, how does that evolution take place in the human soul? And then you start asking yourself that of all the characters in, your, in the show, um, what evolutions are they going through and, and how are they becoming the people they are? Um, and, and, I, and I think a big part of this ultimately, I mean, because we know where Rogue One is gonna get us, it comes down to sacrifice. And you feel that very strongly in these three episodes. So, so I think, personally, me, and I can't speak on behalf of Tony, although we've talked about this sort of thing a lot, I, I, I think the cost of rebellion, the cost of doing something, <laughs> the cost of doing something that you think is right with big stakes, um, what sacrifices are you willing to make? Uh, if these are questions that are swirling around, I think that's, um, those are not only thought provoking, but uh, uh, you know, uh, emotionally um, rich. Sana? No, I mean, I can only add to that, but it's also, you know, the the power that an average person can have when you're pushed in a, you know, to a place where you can't but fight back, you know, and it is a strength to actually move and shift something and, and you know, and be part of rebellion and try to change the world is something in all of us and in everybody. And I think that's why right. the series focuses on a lot of very normal people that are caught up in a very particular, you know, you know, time was in the galaxy far, far away, you know, where really, you know, which are the formative years of the rebellion and, and you know, and I think what that does to you and how people react is just 
you know, it's really at the heart of it and at the heart of Cassian Andros' journey, you know, that that who we know is the rebel that will give us life for the cause. And, and you know, so it's kind of at the heart of it, but I'm sure Tony Gilbert could it all put it all much better. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Gabe uh, from Blast Points. And we're huge fans of George Lucas's first feature film, THX 1138. And there appear to be subtle and not so subtle influences in this prison arc to that film. When working on these episodes, was that something that you looked at thematically? So quite honestly, the answer is no, not, not consciously at first. Uh, we, we started, as I mentioned before, from a place of how do we do a prison sequence that doesn't feel like every other prison we've seen? Um, and and you know, we, we started talking about this sort of bright white antiseptic space uh, we started talking about ways that you could control the inmates without having to use the obvious like gun to the head or what have you. Um, and awesome. so we just started from that very, that very simple place. But writers' minds work in strange and mysterious ways. So, <laughs> so I mean, eventually at a certain point, it, yes, it became obvious and it, that there were <laughs> some of what we were discussing, and especially as we got into production design, bared some resemblance to THX. Uh, and then once you sort of realize that, you can be intentional about it, of course. Um, unconsciously, maybe in, in one or all of us, uh, George Lucas's first feature film was bubbling forth and we weren't fully aware of it. I mean, you, as, as a writer, um, uh, you were constantly uh, uh, resurfacing things that have influenced you over your life. Uh, whether it's, you know, experiences you've had or, or other pieces of art that you're not always fully conscious of when, when there's <laughs> resurfacing. Um, and then only later do you realize, oh, yeah, wow, like there is some stuff. And I actually, because I, I had a, I assumed someone was going to ask about this. I, I went back and watched uh, THX again last night and I was like, wow, yeah, <laughs> holy, holy cow here. Yeah, there's, there's definitely... <laughs> But um, you know, I, I take that as a good sign. You know, we're we're channeling a little bit of OG George Lucas, and that's never a bad thing, Sana. That's never a bad thing. <laughs> hi, Bo. Hi, Sana. Alden and Nikki here from Octo Radio. He's screens are weird. He's down here. Uh, in the hi. current climate, especially post twenty sixteen, we've seen resistance emerge across art, especially in TV. And we think Andor reflects that, particularly with moments like Luthen's monologue in episode 10. So as a writer and producer, respectively, how has crafting this particular story uh, personally helped you both unpack your own ideas and emotions concerning today's world? God, that's a deep question. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've I mean, got all day. I don't know. <laughs> foremost, uh, Andor is a work of fiction. Right. And um, and we're working within a, a, a beloved and vast pre-existing franchise. Uh, and many people have in, interpreted that that franchise back to 1977 in a whole host of ways. Um, and, and so, you know, look, everyone's going to bring their sort of personal history and thoughts and, you know, uh, and, 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 and opinions about the world <laughs> to the table when when they're working on something. But but really you know, our, our, our goal is to service the characters that we've created in the story that feels right for them within a pre-existing framework and try to do something original with it. Uh, yeah. You know, to whatever extent people want to, uh, you know, interpret that, you know, or see it through a particular lens and see it as applicable to anything, you know, uh, past or present, um, that, that's that's wonderful. We, you know, it, it means that maybe you've created something that generates interesting conversations or debates that people could have in terms of influences for us. I mean, you could, you know, uh, you, know you, you could look at the French resistance, you could look at the American Revolution, you could look at a whole host of different things that one could draw comparisons to. And, um, but, uh, but, but honestly, and, you know, we're not sitting down trying to think about this in any sort of didactic or essayistic way when we're doing it we're literally like okay uh like so you know what's he like with his mom at breakfast you know like what does that look like and you just try to build a believable world and when you build a believable world naturally um you know and it's a complex and sophisticated world if you're lucky enough to get to that stage uh it, it leaves a lot open to interpretation and that's a good thing 
Sana? Therefore, I think you can really also, you know, in a fantasy and, you know, in a, when you're in, in that, when you're moving in that genre in the galaxy far, far away, if you're creating a, you know, a piece of fiction that is, you know, telling a truthful and complex and political story that is true to that world, I think, you know, it is a real, you know, a lot of people find, you know, emotional connections to characters, to situations, and it, that can, you know, touch them and, and and I think that is a really wonderful thing about fantasy well that is it for the interviews for now who knows like here's hoping we get invited to more <laughs> yeah as we as we say in Spanish tan triste cuando se acaba so sad when it's I over see. it's mm -hmm. uh you know it was, it was really fun experience again you know talking to all of these amazing amazing creators these creatives uh it's so cool it's something that you know I hope keeps happening like you know I'm 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 happy if this is it and it never happens again because I never yeah we never thought that this was going to happen to try at but uh yeah. you know we're crossing our fingers that it keeps happening because we're having a lot a lot of fun with this. <laughs> I know it's it's incredible to actually get this behind the scenes look before the behind the scenes before, edition of stuff exactly. comes out. I know it's it's a completely different experience. I never thought we we're going to yeah. have this level of access to something we love so much. So. And this might be actually I'm gonna I'm gonna like uh you know toot our own horn here. This might be the only time that people are really gonna get this much behind the scenes content because you know they're not really doing uh, physical media releases of yeah. like the the shows and whatnot. So we're not getting like those bonus DVDs like we used to in the past. So maybe this yeah. is it, guys. Like you have to tune in to try out the force to get all your behind the scenes goodies. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. <laughs> so we hope that you enjoyed we hope that we get invited to more stuff so we can keep bringing it to you as well yes. and remember that we are triad of the force you can find us wherever podcasts can be found just search triad of the force and you will find us like subscribe ring that bell leave a comment you like this you don't see if there's other people you'd be interested in us interviewing if we can actually get you know more yeah. invitations through that go ahead just let us know <laughs> let us know so that we can pray because that's basically all we can do yeah. <laughs> so until next time we will be with you towards the end of andor and then eventually going back to regular scheduling programming because we just love star wars in general too so mm -hmm. <laughs> until and next other time things. <laughs> and other things yeah there's still a lot of things that we need to discuss that we haven't had enough time to we'll get to that there's we'll a lot of nerd dumb greatness out there that we'll get to so don't worry about it and you can always suggest what else you want us to talk about so yeah let us know until next time may the force be with you mm -hmm.